Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about several factors that affect the flow of blood through the cardiovascular system. And to do this, we're actually going to look at an equation. Its full name is the Hagen Poissier equation, although sometimes you'll just see it written as the Poissier equation. And depending on your course, for anatomy and physiology, you may or may not use an equation that looks like this, or the Poissier equation, but it turns out that it's actually very useful to describe the factors that affect the flow of blood. Okay, And we're actually going to look at four factors. We're going to look at the size of the pressure gradient, we're going to look at the blood viscosity, the vessel length, and the vessel diameter. And these latter three are actually going to be factors that directly affect what we call vascular resistance. Okay. Now this equation over here is the Hagen-Poissier equation, or sometimes just called the Poissier equation. The Q right here actually means blood flow. In previous videos, we may have defined this as cardiac output. In this context, we're going to say the Q is the blood flow. And it's equal to the magnitude of the pressure gradient, we'll talk about what that is in a minute, times pi, which is just mathematical pi, 3.14, times the radius of the vessel to the fourth power, divided by eight, divided by the viscosity, which is the Greek letter eta, and then divided by the vessel length. Okay. Now, this is generally used for physics problems where you're dealing with simple pipes. You know, you got water running through pipes like that lead to your shower, or your sink, or something like that. But conceptually, it's useful to describe blood flow through the cardiovascular system. And the first factor that affects the amount of blood flow is the pressure gradient, specifically the size of the pressure gradient. Now notice it's not just the pressure, it's not an absolute pressure, just P. It's delta P, which means a change in pressure, or a pressure gradient, and specifically a gradient between two points of the pipe. So again, if you imagine your, your shower, the pipe that brings water uh, into the faucet, or the sink or something, the, the water is going to be flowing from one point to another. We'll call the initial point A the second point B. Right? In the context of the cardiovascular system, we could say that point A is in the aorta, and point B is all the way back at the right atrium where blood is eventually returned. If you need understanding of that, go back and watch the videos on the flow or the pathway of blood through the system. Okay? But point A could be the aorta, point B could be right at back at the right atrium. Okay? And it turns out that the greater the pressure difference between those two points in space, the greater the flow of blood. Okay, and so that's what our delta P is going to be. Now, if we go back and look at this picture, it's very useful to understand this. Let's look at the bottom case first. Let's suppose we had a situation where the pressure, and by the way, these are mean arterial pressures. Let's say the pressure in the aorta was zero millimeters of mercury, and then all the way at the right atrium, this really doesn't change, but the pressure at the right atrium is about zero also. But notice in this case that there is no difference, right? It's zero initially and zero finally. And actually, if we look at this pressure difference, it's zero. If we were to imagine plugging zero in for this delta P, I don't care what this other stuff is, there would be zero blood flow. So that's a look at this mathematically. But in, ma in other words, if the heart was not pumping at all, okay, so there's no pressure being generated by the heart, so the pressure near the aorta is zero, you have no blood flow, right? And this makes sense for two reasons. One, you can think about it like a dead person, someone whose heart stopped. Okay? If their heart stopped, it's no longer beating, it's no longer contracting, therefore it's no longer pumping blood. So it's not generating any blood pressure, right? Zero millimeters of mercury as measured in the aorta. Well, again, the pressure near the right atrium, regardless of whether you're alive or dead, is still going to be about zero. So again, there's no flow of blood because the heart's not pumping. But another thing is that liquids always flow or move from high pressure to low pressure. And so it's analogous to diffusion. Remember diffusion, which you should understand at this point, is particles moving from high concentration to low concentration. It's always high to low. So there is no high pressure here. They're both the same, so there's no flow. Okay? So always keep in mind that liquids move from high pressure to low pressure. Okay. But if we compare this, let's say, to a living person at rest, at rest the mean arterial pressure as measured near the aorta is about 98 millimeters of mercury. But again, near the right atrium, it's about zero. And so in this case, we do have a pressure gradient. 
okay? Because blood is gonna flow from high mean arterial pressure, 98 millimeters of mercury, down to zero, okay? So in this case, we have unidirectional flow of blood from the aorta to the right atrium. But notice we can also increase the size of this pressure gradient. For example, if we then go to exercise or a fight or flight response, we know the heart is going to contract faster and it's also going to contract with more force. Force is the key. And so if the heart's pumping with more force, you're going to have a higher blood pressure. Now, it can get a lot higher than 98 millimeters of mercury, but notice it's just greater than 98 millimeters of mercury. And so in this case, this is meant to show the steeper a line right here, we have a steeper gradient. So this is, we could say maybe 120 millimeters of mercury, and it's still going to zero. And in that case, the pressure gradient's larger. Okay, here the pressure gradient's 98 minus zero, so it's 98, but here it would be, let's say, 120 minus zero, so the pressure gradient's 120. And so the larger the pressure gradient, the greater the blood flow. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, there are some other things that contribute to what's called vascular resistance. And this is the amount of friction the blood experiences as it flows through the vessel. Okay? Resistance opposes blood flow. So the more resistance you have, the less blood flow there's going to be. Okay? And there's three factors that we can look at that all contribute to vascular resistance in some way. Okay? Um, one of them is blood viscosity, which is given in this by eta looks like a lowercase n almost. We have vessel length, which is just L, and then the vessel diameter, which we can actually, really we're gonna measure it as a radius, but it's proportional to the diameter, okay? Now first let's look at blood viscosity. Now blood viscosity generally is gonna be constant over short periods of time. This is not something we can regulate um, just very quickly, but greater viscosity of the blood increases resistance. Now if you're not familiar with what viscosity is, Okay, imagine this. If you just look at water, water has a pretty low viscosity, but compare that to honey or molasses or something like that. Honey and molasses have a lot greater viscosity, and it's sort of visible if you try to pour it out of a bottle. If you pour water out of a water bottle, it just, you know, falls out practically. But if you try to pour honey out, it moves really slowly. Okay, so just by nature of a fluid, like blood, being more viscous, it's going to provide more resistance because it's not going to flow as quickly. Okay, now you say, well, what factors could change that viscosity? Well, for example, um, dehydration or doping with erythropoietin. So in dehydration, that implies that you have a smaller water content of your blood. And if there's a smaller water content, then the blood's going to be more viscous. Um, also EPO, this is actually a natural hormone, erythropoietin, but there's actually been cases where professional athletes, Lance Armstrong was exposed for doing this, he doped with erythropoietin. If you recall what this hormone did, it increases the synthesis of red blood cells. And by having more red blood cells in your blood, it increases the blood viscosity. Okay? And so, again, this right here, Anything that increases blood viscosity increases resistance, but that's going to decrease the blood flow because viscosity, you can see here, is in the denominator of this equation, okay? mathematically speaking. Again, we can also say a decreased blood viscosity will increase blood flow. So anemia, even though anemia is bad, okay, if you were to have a decreased blood viscosity, that will increase blood flow. Okay. Um, that's actually what will happen if somebody takes a blood thinner like warfarin, coumadin. Coumadin will actually inhibit blood clotting, and so it actually thins your blood. And so it decreases blood viscosity, which actually helps um, at least eliminate some of the risk of having a stroke. Okay. So decreasing this blood viscosity increases blood flow, but increasing blood viscosity decreases blood flow. Okay. Generally speaking, having a very viscous blood is bad. Okay. Now, a second factor that increases vascular resistance is the vessel length. Now, this is something that is constant over long periods of time. This is not something the body can even regulate really at all. Okay? Um, blood viscosity is, is, the body can change it by changing the amount of EPO that it makes. The vessel length is pretty much constant all the time. And it really depends on how much adiposity you have. So for people that have a big gut, so they have more body fat, obviously the vessels are going to have to be longer to accommodate all of that extra mass. Okay, And so if you have people with longer vessel length, then that's going to increase 
resistance and decrease blood flow. Notice that this length is in the denominator as well. So if you increase the length that the blood has to travel through, then you decrease blood flow. Okay? Uh, one application of this other than just weight gain is people who are abnormally tall. Um, a lot of times you see this in people with pituitary gigantism um, or people who just have um, just abnormally tall. They usually don't live as long. And the reason they don't live as long is just by nature of being taller like that, they have longer blood vessels. And in order to maintain appropriate blood flow and perfusion to all their tissues, the heart has to work harder. Um, it's not just something that they're diseased and they die young or something like that. It's that the heart actually has to work very hard in order to pump blood and get adequate perfusion in spite of their massive vessel length from being so tall. Okay? But for most people who don't have conditions like that where they're just abnormally tall, um, one way you can decrease your vessel length is simply by losing weight. In contrast, if you gain a bunch of weight, that is pretty much body fat, then you're going to increase resistance and decrease blood flow. Okay? But vessel length, other than losing weight or gaining weight, this is not regulated. Okay? It's constant over long periods of time. Now, this one down here, the vessel diameter, and really we're going to, we can actually consider this really the vessel radius. Um, the vessel radius is highly regulated and it's very quickly regulated. Okay? Um, this is the major contributor to changes in resistance. And we represent the radius, really. We, I probably shouldn't have put diameter, but the radius is through this R right here to the fourth power. And since it's to the fourth power, you can see that it has a very strong effect on resistance and therefore blood flow. And this, this regulation is going to occur primarily in arterioles via sympathetic nervous system stimulation or lack thereof. So for example, if we were to apply sympathetic nervous stimulation to most arterioles, what's going to happen is they're going to vasoconstrict. Okay, so that means if they vasoconstrict, their diameter is going to decrease. We know that, right? So if their diameter decreases, their radius is going to decrease, right? Because diameter and radius, radius is half the diameter. So how does this work? If I apply sympathetic nervous system stimulation to arterioles, most of them that is, they're going to vasoconstrict. Okay? And so when you vasoconstrict an arterial or a blood vessel in general, the diameter is going to decrease. They're going to become less wide. They're going to constrict. And so the radius of that blood vessel is going to decrease. Okay? And if you decrease this radius, you're going to decrease blood flow. And actually, this is a very powerful tool for the body to restrict blood flow to certain parts of the body. For example, when you're having a sympathetic uh, fight-or-flight response, uh, you don't want digestion uh, to be occurring in the GI tract. You don't want urine formation in the urinary tract. So generally speaking, the blood flow to those areas, it doesn't get eliminated, but it's drastically reduced uh, so that you can have an adequate fight or flight response and not waste energy on things that are unnecessary. And so you'll vasoconstrict the arterioles leading to those capillary beds that serve those parts of the body. Okay. So vasoconstrict, it decreases the radius of the blood vessel and gives you less blood flow to that area. In contrast, vasodilation, that's if you want more blood flow to an area. You vasodilate the arterioles leading to those capillary beds. And when you vasodilate, you increase the diameter of that blood vessel. So if you increase the diameter, you're also increasing the radius of that blood vessel. And by increasing the radius, if we increase R, that'll increase blood flow. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. So really in conclusion here, we've got four factors that affect the blood flow through the cardiovascular system. The first one really doesn't deal with resistance. It's just the pressure gradient, the difference in pressure between two points in the pipe, so to speak. So again, we usually can measure that initially at the aorta where the pressure is highest, all the way back to the right atrium where it's lowest, usually about zero millimeters of mercury. And so you can see here, if we raise the pressure in the aorta, it raises the pressure gradient. Okay? And so by increasing the pressure gradient, we can see through this equation that will increase the blood flow. Okay? And then there's three factors that contribute to vascular resistance. We have blood viscosity, which increases resistance. We have vessel length, which increases resistance, and then vessel diameter, which if we increase the diameter, it actually decreases resistance. So if we 
uh, decrease the diameter, we increase resistance. But you can see here that any of those factors that increases resistance is going to cause a reduction in blood flow. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.